Okay, thank you for uh, attending this session on the extended uh, producer responsibility in textiles. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then the floor is for Veronique Allaire of Refashion because she has a long experience and we can learn a lot about uh, EPR by her experience. Uh, EPR, uh, to me, uh, I'm not an expert, is the, the obligation to take back as a manufacturer of uh, your products uh, end of life. Uh, so before or at the moment that they become waste uh, end of life, well, it's your responsibility to take them back. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, in my uh, uh, sector says uh, the obligation to take back. No, 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 no. It is the extended producer responsibility. So it is a, a complicated way to, to state what I explained. Uh, in Belgium, we have uh, the experience since two years of uh, the EPR in mattresses. So the obligation uh, for uh, the whole country to take back the, the mattresses. Mattresses uh, are a complex product with uh, a lot of textiles. And uh, it took uh, about uh, five years of preparation, five years of preparation to come to the system, to, to make the system start. And still it is not perfect, but uh, Everybody is involved, the manufacturers, and of course, also the, the retailers. And big retailers like IKEA also play the game. So it's not, not an easy uh, task. And uh, uh, the, export, the, the additional problem is that uh, addresses, when uh, end of life, well, they had to be collected. And uh, it is the individual responsibility of the retailers or the manufacturers to do that. But it's uh, complex and it's not your business, it's not the business of a manufacturer to take back and so on. So we have a system, an organization, uh, we created an organization, Valumat, uh, to evaluate the mattresses, perhaps is that the name, Valumat, and all stakeholders are concerned uh, in this, uh, or in this Valumat. So it is a very transparent and uh, responsible uh, organization to organize this uh, take back of uh, uh, mattresses. And uh, you say that that is because of the circular economy. Eh? Uh, you make uh, something and you take back and you reuse it. That's, that's the theory. But uh, in practice, it is a lot of more complicated. Uh, reuse is for mattresses almost not possible. And then you have the whole system. Actually, the circular economy just starts there when the mattresses are back uh, and you have these uh, collected and we have uh, municipalities that are responsible for the collection. We have to pay them. And then the whole process of uh, disassembling starts and then see what parts can be recycled, what is non-recyclable and how do we treat these recycled products? And the non-recycled uh, recyclable parts, what will we do with uh, just pure waste or can it burnt or, or some other useful uh, use? Can we do that? So it is a complex a system that starts from the moment that you have the obligation to take back uh, the product. And uh, Veronique Allaire is going to, to give us a, a very good uh, example because of our, our long experience. Uh, but the mattresses, is a, it is also, a, in a Belgium, a costly affair. Because uh, for a, a double person mattress, it's, I think, uh, I don't know the exact figure, but about 15 euros uh, that you have to pay in advance for all this uh, treatment uh, after use. Uh, so it is, it is, and these tariffs can be revised uh, each year because the costs are high. And most of the costs, of course, are for these immediate, intermediate uh, steps uh, of uh, collection, disassembling, recycling, and uh, use or not use afterwards. These uh, different steps, they cost a lot. And uh, it has to be paid, paid by uh, the purchase of each mattress. And each mattress gets an extra fee of about euro for a double mattress. So that uh, is, is not only complex, but also, you see, costly. And costs uh, will always rise, you know that. Uh, two elements before I give the floor to uh, Veronique is that uh, we 
should be aware of the fact that in two years and three months, in 2025, uh, there will be an EPR for all textiles. So we are all concerned. Uh, in a few years, it will be an obligation. That's the first thing. So be aware, it is not uh, far away. It is not something that you can say, it is not for me. It is uh, very near, it is for everybody. A second uh, point is that um, we uh, must avoid to uh, put in place different systems in each uh, member country. Uh, there, there must be uh, certainly a, a, a harmonization. Harmonization is key. Uh, will it uh, work in, in Europe on a European level? If we don't do that, and we have a system in each country, that will not work. It will be also very costly because you will have to do in each country everything for uh, each textile. When you do it on a European level, coordinated, harmonized, then you can have specialization and you can have uh, efficiency, optimization of uh, the EPR system. So we need to work together. But of course, since you are here, you know that we need to work together. And now I give the floor to Veronique. Hello, everyone. Just to make a little precision, um, within two years, the EPR won't be mandatory. It's the collection of collection. all textile and clothes, which will be mandatory in Europe. Uh, but of course, EPR could be a very good theme in order to do that. And I will share with you the French example. So uh, I don't know, yes, if you can see. So I'm just going to share uh, why I'm talking. I will share with you some slides. Um, I will pass quite fast on some of them, but you will have the presentation after. So um, first and foremost, and uh, Far just said it, uh, it's a collaborative project. An EPR is always a collaborative project. It's a way to have all the stakeholders to work together towards one main objective. It's to transform the industry towards circular economy. And I insist on that. EPR, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it was meant to manage waste. But today we are, of course, we're talking about waste, but not only. It's all about the circular economy. And it begins with the production of the product. Because in order to have this circular economy, we've got to think, to rethink the production of the product so that it will be, it will long last, uh, it will last longer, but also because it will be able to be reused and it will be able to be recycled at the end. So who are we? Uh, so the name of the EPR in France is Refashion. Maybe you heard before about Eco TLC. This is the same company, we just changed our name. And so we were created in 2008. And um, it was, um, we were created because it was mandatory by the French law. It was an obligation by the French law. This extended producer responsibility was an obligation by the French law. And so, it's, um, but it's a private company. This is not a public company. This is really the meeting of all the producer and retailer. In fact, when you say producer in France, it's more brands than producer. It's really the, the people who are putting the product on the market, who are selling the product, who got together in order to create this company, which is a non-profit company, but private. And so you can see the list of the different brands who are uh, member or the associates who are owning the company. And among those associates, we have a board uh, of manager. And you can see it's not only textile in France, we also have the footwear, which is uh, also in the, same, uh, in the same category, because most of the retailers who are selling textiles, they're also selling footwear. So this is uh, the history. Um, part of the company, you also have the, feder the representative of those uh, manufacturer, retailer, who are the federation. Some of them are with us uh, today, of course. Um, so just um, to remind you, our main objective is really to transform the industry towards um, circularity. This is really our, our, our vision. Then how do we do it? So our mission is first eco-design. Then, of course, it's reuse and recycling. Um, and in terms of priority, the, the, the priority are about revaluing waste because our product 
are our future resources. This is really the main thing. We have to think in terms of resources, and our product today, our waste, and in fact, we are quite avoiding the word waste today. We're talking about new material, we're talking about feedstock, but the word waste, because the idea, the whole idea, it's really to uh, turn all those products in new resources. And um, so we have, for that, we have to rethink, of course, production and then reimagine consumption because one of the key, uh, the key uh, about all this transition, it's the hand user, what we call the hand user, which shouldn't be the hand user, which is the consumer, and let's say the citizen, because all of us, we are using textiles, so it's not about only consumers, it's about citizens. So we have a business model, it can appear a little bit complicated, but just to make it short, so the brands have to pay an, what it called an eco fee or eco contribution. And in fact, they are paying a very small amount. It's less, uh, it used to be less than one euro. This year it became, uh, not one euro, sorry, one cent. It used to be less than one cent per item. And this year it became above one, in average, above one cent per item. But then it's, uh, it's not the same cost or the same fee for all items, because of course, very small items have a lesser fee than very uh, heavy items. And it's in terms of uh, weight. Uh, so they pay this eco contribution to refashion, and refashion then is using this eco contribution to um, to really um, facilitate the transition of the oil industry. First, it's about uh, communicating to the citizen to ex to explain to them and to uh, raise their awareness about the way they are consuming textiles. So it's about uh, maybe consuming less, using longer the textile, the clothes, everything, and also um, repairing them, and then at the end, uh, bringing them to deposit so that they will be reused and recycled. And we are doing this work, we have a nationwide campaign, but mostly we're doing this work with the local authorities. And we are financing the local authorities so that they are doing local communication in order to tell the citizen, okay, this is where you can bring your clothes when you don't want to use them anymore. And really, we are making a lot of efforts because people in France are super attached. They have a real affection for their clothes. So we are making a lot of efforts to explain to them that they should give them away the sooner the better. Uh, if they don't use them, they have to give them away so that they will be reused. And because at the end, there is a huge risk if they keep them and they just uh, uh, remove them when they are moving uh, from one house to the other, it will go to the garbage. And this is what we want to avoid at all, uh, all means, by all means. Then we are also um, uh, financing the, the collectors. Uh, not financing directly the collectors. We are helping, we are contracting the collectors so that we can tr uh, track the traceability of what is collected everywhere in France in order to insist in the area where the collection is not so good. In average, in France, we have a 3.5 kilo per inhabitant of collection, but it varies a lot depending on the different areas and depending on two aspects. Of course, the uh, commitment of the local authority, but first and foremost, on the mindset of the population. This is to say you have region where people are really committed to uh, better, a better management of their waste, and they will do this, uh, um, they will deposit their clothes. In other regions, it's more difficult. Um, then we are founding the sorters, and this is one of the, um, uh, it was uh, the creation of the uh, EPR. It was meant to be because um, the sorters had, uh, with the fast fashion, the sorters had more and more difficulties to uh, to uh, to expand their uh, their sorting, and we wanted them to expand the sorting so that we could collect more. And with the um, diminishing of the quality of the clothes they were cl collecting, their financial balance was uh, was jeopardized. And so we started funding them in order to 
in fact, finance the recycling aspect of the clothes, which are much more expensive. Of course, the reuse is profitable for the time being, but the recycling has always a cost. And the end uh, of life of the clothes with um, uh, what we call CSR, uh, uh, which is EPF, is also cost also a lot. And uh, also, we encourage innovation because, of course, this development of this new uh, industry, new recycling industry, needs innovation in term, uh, in order to uh, to be more profitable and in order to avoid having an EPR scheme within, I hope, uh, <laughs> I don't know, six years, eight years, ten years, because uh, we should, at the end, when it will be profitable, we won't it won't be necessary to have an EPR scheme anymore. So uh, just a few dates. Uh, we are uh, at the end of our third accreditation and we are in the midst of a, a huge modification of our um, a contractual agreement with uh, public authorities. And we will have a new EPR scheme starting next year. I will talk a little bit later about that. Just again, some figures. Um, in France, alors, those are French uh, figures, I'm sorry, uh, but this is a, one of the aspects of EPR. It helps you to have traceability and to have data. Um, so in France, we have uh, around uh, three, mil, mm, three billions um, uh, three billions of items, textile, clothes, put on footwear, put on the market every year. This represents 700 around 700 uh, thousand um 700 thousand tons of um, of goods and among those uh, 700 thousand of goods uh, only 34 percent are collected what happens with the rest of it it's either in the cupboards or in the garbage or we don't know where so we have the, 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 big, enfin, the big objective is to collect at least 50%. Today we are only at 34%. The objective is 50%. And then among those uh, 34% which are collected, only a part of it will be sorted within the sorting facilities accredited and contracted by Refashion in France and in Europe. We have 66 facilities who have uh, a contract with Refashion. Um, among them, uh, you have to know that 15 are outside of France, um, in Belgium, in uh, Germany, in Spain. Um, but those who are uh, outside of France are sorting French textile. This is the way we can support them. Then, what happens when it goes to the sorting facilities? Um, around 57% uh, uh, will be reused, but mostly it will be, be used far away. You heard about Africa, and this is true. Africa is the number one uh, market. The African market is the number one market for reuse, and only 5% of the reuse is staying in France. We have to increase this. The new agreement will push everyone with figures, with objective, with uh, uh, will push everyone to increase this reuse uh, locally uh, in France and in Europe. In terms of recycling, recycling represents 32 percent, and uh, those 32 percent are again mostly done far away. When when I say far away, it's mostly Asia, it's Pakistan and India. Again, it's a shame. We have all those resources, we are sending them back there, and it's quite normal for the time being, because we don't have the production anymore here. It's mostly over there. Still, some of them are coming back for recycling here. For example, you can take the example of Prato. They do not hide it. Most of their wool is coming from India, is sorted in India. Why? Because it's much cheaper, because for the time being, sorting is mostly manual. It's not automatic. And why? Because the technology is not yet there. We're very close. There are many new projects coming, and uh, some of them are even there. We've got to check them. The, today, you have a huge facility 
in Malmö, you have the inauguration of this huge facility, Siptex in Malmö. Some of the VW fashion team are there, and hopefully it's working, and we have a great hope with that. But there are several among you. Uh, I know that there are people working on the subject. Then you have the solid recovered fuel. Solid recovered fuel, uh, this morning someone has been talking about it. This is what I call uh, CSR, but it's uh, SRF for you. This solid recovered fuel, it will increase because if we want to increase the amount of collected textile, of course we are going to collect less quality, and so this will increase. Today it's a black ship for all the environmental uh, people, but it's much better to have solid recovered fuel, which, which has a very high, pers uh, far, the highest percentage of combustion compared to simple energy recovery, not to say, of course, landfill. So, um, and when, we, when the energy is so complicated today in Europe, we have to, um, we really have to work on this topic. This is something major. Um, just key figures about the budget. So the contribution uh, this year has been uh, 51 million euro. We always have um, a difference between what we are calling in terms of contribution and what we are uh, giving because it goes from one year to the other. So the contributions this year were 51 million euro. When we've been funding the sorting facilities last year, so this contribution was made on last year uh, product sold on the market and the funding paid to, to the 66 sorting facility was 23 million because it was based on what we had been um, uh, what we had been calling the year before so it will be even more next year of course uh, in terms of research and development this is something very important and this is one of the key role of the uh, of the EPR organization so um, we've been spending uh, 5.6 million uh, with 60 uh, different projects that we've been funding since we created uh, uh, the innovation challenge and in terms of conception uh, it's 2.5 million uh, but then we don't take into account all the communication done by the local authority, authorities be, be behind what we are funding. Um, in terms of members, something also important for you, it's 6,000 different members. You have to know that at the end of this year, we will have around 10,000 uh, 10, uh, members. 10,000 members because they've been uh, a much larger call this year in order to really bring together all the stakeholders before the renewal of the uh, of the agreement. Um, some key project uh, I told you the first step. In fact, we focus on the really on the three stage of the product life cycle. So uh, first step, um, which is very important, this is the eco design. And going along with the eco design, you have also the environmental labeling. Sometimes uh, this morning you had some question about the measurements. How do we measure the sustainability? How do we um, label the sustainability? You have new rules coming. The PEF, the European PEF uh, will really help you and it, it's arriving it's just next year we've been a lot of uh, um, uh, there've been a lot of brands involved in this project and it's um, it will be a shared way to measure and also to labelize all the product in a clear way to un, to offer traceability to the end consumer and uh, and also to offer traceability to the whole industry because it has an impact also on recycling um, of course promoting environmental assessment. This is also something major. Then you have um, everything concerning the conception. So we have to raise the awareness of the citizen, and this is something mandatory. Otherwise, uh, nothing will happen. And this is taking a very long time. We've been working on this for 12 years, and it's just the awareness is becoming uh, really stronger in France. And we can see it in the way the people at least are saying they're purchasing. Not in the real purchase, to be honest, but whenever you are asking them, they say, yes, yes, I make efforts, yes. <laughs> so this is one step, but we have to go further. Just to give you another information, the average price of textile item in France today is 12 euro. 
This morning, we were talking about margin and the fact that we cannot add one cent on the product. What have we done? I was a producer, I was a retailer. I've been working in this industry for 15 years. What have we done? 12 euro, an average price, can you imagine? So really, we have to work harder to raise the awareness and to do something. Um, and then, for, of course, the collections, the sorting, the re reuse and recycling. Reuse is key. Reuse is the better option. So we have to increase reuse, not only far away. We have to increase reuse here, and we have to also to change the perception of the citizen for reuse. So 12 years on innovation, those are some examples of closed loop uh, innovation, but also open loop innovation. Uh, there are some great opportunity in non-woven, in composite, plastogy, and of course, closed loop yarns. Uh, voilà. um, An innovation should also cover the, the way uh, the producer is cons uh, designing the product for recycling. This is really also for demantelment and recycling. Uh, we are also trying to um, bring together all the stakeholders um, among the industrial people who are able to use this recycled material. And one of the tools is the Recycle Refashion Platform. Um, we are also doing mapping in order to explain to everyone, OK, what do we do with your clothes? So this looks a little bit weird, but it goes from the center where you have the key material, which are collected, to the uh, periphery, where you can see all the uh, outputs that you can have from those textiles. And uh, there are so many. It's not only closed loop is a part of it, but open loop, you have them in uh, plastogy, you have them in transport, you have them in the building, you have them on the roads, you have them everywhere. Geotextile, name it. Paper, name it. Um, in order to, to help the industry to change, we have to understand also what we are dealing with. One of the most important complexity of our industry is the the type of material we are dealing with. Um, so we are uh, doing a comprehensive study uh, in the sorting facility in different types and different region uh, in order to understand the distribution of the tonnage by type of product, by type of fabric, by type of um, texture. Uh, and so we will have the result of this study in March 23. Maybe you heard about Fashion for Good. We've been working with Fashion for Good because this is a survey we've done in the past already three times. So this is a fourth edition. And we've been helping them to build the same study in Europe. And uh, this is available now. So you can, uh, you can have it and we will have ours uh, by March. Uh, also, um, in order to um, to have this automatization of sorting, it's super important to have uh, the, same, um, the same data. And so we've been building a textile library, a post-consumer textile library. With, we wanted to have 500 samples. You have to bear in mind that we wanted to have 88% of the industry uh, uh, samples, but we realized we had just 45% of the retail samples. This is to say, the number of different material is huge. And this is why it's so complicated, because the items are small. I said three uh, billions of items and so many different fabric. And so this uh, textile material library is, uh, is available uh, uh, for, for the people who want to test automatic sorting. So after two years, what is the analysis uh, that we have done? Um, we have five areas of improvement to leverage, reuse, and recycling. Those are the two keys. We need to uh, invest massively in industrialization. I think we've been talking about that also this morning. Industrialization of recycling solutions in Europe, because today everything is going abroad. We have to improve product durability uh, throughout its life cycle. We have to increase the collection of textiles, okay, both in quality and quantity. We have to optimize the sorting efficiency for reuse, but also for recycling. 
And we have to develop the sorting and preparation facilities for recycling, because sorting is not the only thing. Then you have to prepare the material. And when I say prepare, this is, and it will be different for uh, every output, every specification of the industrial who is going to reuse this material. And so this is absolutely key. The key learning is that timing and priority on the situation depends on the situation of each country. This is why uh, a global uh, European EPR is maybe not the solution, but we need to have, uh, we are on the on a European market, and so we need to have some consistency, because as I said, we are today, we are working with European recyclers, some of them are here today, and we are working with European sorting facilities, because when you are local in a region, you don't have the quantity in order to address a different market. We need to be together. This is a region, when I say a region, this is a continental market. This is a European market, the recycling market. And we need to work together. So we need to have some um, similarities and we need to have a sa the same framework so that we will work together well. Also because the brands are European, we are an open market. When I'm quoting, Timberlands or H&M or Decathlon, they are not only in France, they are on, on all European markets. So we need some consistency, otherwise it's going to be a nightmare and it won't work. Um, some do's and don'ts, I'm checking, yeah, some do's and don'ts, uh, so, uh, uh, but maybe I'm leaving the question because I've been talking too much already. So ask some question, you will see, you can see the do's and don'ts and uh, you can ask um, some questions. Yes. Yeah. When you speak about recycling, I understand you always speak about mechanical recycling. No. Ah, no. Not you only have mechanical, but also chemical or molecular. Of course. You have mechanical, you have thermomechanical, and you have, of course, chemical recycling, which, uh, which is booming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Ralf Kampöner from the Confederation of the German Textile and Fashion Industry, heading the Brussels office. Thank you for your presentation. I liked your conclusion on the need for European homogeneity and, uh, you know, uh, having framework conditions um, that apply for the, in, in my words, for the entire internal market. Now, in France, we had this um, thing that uh, in French is called Synodétique Triman, and which is a national French um, law in this respect, which applies only to France. Mm. And when you want to place um, articles on the market in France, you need to compl compl comply with it. And I hear quite a lot of voices from the German companies who say, well, how should we comply with that? Because uh, as soon as we have to do with France, we need to learn a lot of things. What do you say about that? And uh, what hope can you give our companies? Um, I'm so sorry about that, <laughs> I should say, because it's not part of, uh, this is, I would say, this is not our fault. This is uh, uh, public authorities, the ministry who decided that, but I understand. And this is why we shouldn't make the same mistakes. Uh, we have to avoid that kind of mistakes. I don't say that it's a mistake to have three men. I say when you are in, on an open market, it's super difficult and we won't have a relabeling for each country. It doesn't make sense. I agree with you. I agree with you. Voilà. Cédric. Yeah, um, actually I had a similar question, but I'm going to ask another one. Well, refashion is well started from clothing and shoes you're now also into home textiles. Mm -hmm. What about technical textiles? Because there it really becomes difficult. But it's a big market. Alors, in fact, it was a decision again of the public authority. I don't want to hide behind them, but it's, uh, they decided to... Uh, in fact, technical textiles are not so big in France, are very small. Uh, uh, technical professional textiles don't have EPR but they are working on their recycling process and they are building their own recycling process and we are working together with them because in fact it's quite the same, uh, we have the same issues and uh, once they have a recycling uh, facilities, um, for example, we have a new, there is a new facility called Renaissance Textile, which is a facility which 
has been dedicated to the professional textile, but we are going to work along with them because, of course, what applies to technical textile will apply to, uh, to the other textiles because it's even more complicated for, for the technical textiles. So um, they are not part of the EPR scheme, uh, but we are working along with them, really. Yes, I understand your question, uh, Frederick, because uh, technical textiles, it's mostly uh, textiles and chemicals uh, and a uh, lot of combination of products, uh, laminated products. So it's, it's, a, it's a degree uh, of a complication that is far much higher than fashion. And, and that, uh, for instance, in Belgium, is 50% uh, of the textiles industry, technical textiles, has become the, the most important part of the textiles. So, uh, it's, but it's the most complicated. I think that uh, the challenge there will be very, very big. Yes, a question here. I'm just giving the tickets. You stood here. Yeah, no, 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 no. In the front. Well, uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. My name is Pedro Nazare. I, I'm the CEO of Eletraum. I, I lead uh, three EPR systems in Portugal, mm -hmm. packaging, batteries, and electronics. Um, and presently, we are leading uh, an initiative to set the textile uh, recycling system in Portugal under the EPR because mm -hmm. in our legislation we have foreseen in two years to have set uh, mm -hmm. uh, a transposed EPR uh, legislation mm -hmm. to, the, to the textile sector. So I'm very, let's say, interested in two particular aspects mm -hmm. of your presentation. One would be to understand a bit more about the collection shares in terms of the different actors because you spoke about mm -hmm. collection points. Mm -hmm. I, I bet that municipalities, they do have a role there. Mm -hmm. Retailers, they should have a share there as sure. well. And maybe economic operators that have their activity related yes. to reuse. Mm -hmm. and so understanding a bit more the market share in terms of collection on one hand, <laughs> and on the other hand, also uh, understanding how was your setup process in dealing with these mm -hmm. uh, present interests. Because I guess when you established, they yeah. were there already doing some collection and doing yeah. some sorting. So this is, goes to question mm -hmm. number one. I can, I'll go for the second okay. question as well. Um, very quickly, just okay. to understand, in the sorting centers, um, if you have already some sorting standards in place, uh, mainly to address uh, the items that are, let's say, possible to reuse, mm -hmm. in the sense that you are shipping them overseas, mm -hmm. and so in what way have you developed your activity, mm -hmm. and if you are at this point yet? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so for the time being, uh, refashion is a financial eco-organism. This is to say, it's um, we don't own the feedstock, <laughs> to be very simple. We are financing, we are funding uh, different stakeholders so that it works. From January 23, we will become hybrid, mixed. We will still be... Uh, financial show for what we call the historical actors and then we will also become uh, operational on the rest. Uh, for, so I can talk about what we know <laughs> which is uh, until today. So until today the collection was done um, not directly by the uh, local authorities, it was done in fact by uh, uh, collectors, uh, collector operator, um, and uh, who are on one side uh, mostly uh, non-profit organization, uh, association, and uh, such as uh, Red Cross, for example. And, uh, but all of them are doing that, and it's quite, um, in fact, it's, a, it's historical in France. They used to be the, the, doing that for, for centuries, and, um, and it's part of their business model. This is to say, when they collect, uh, clothes, uh, when they collect textiles uh, and everything, they are, uh, part of them is, uh, goes to their uh, stores, but part of them is resold and it's part of the business model because it, it's the way they are funded for other activities. And, um, but uh, then you also have, for example, stores. You have brands who have launched uh, the collection, you have uh, some uh, local authority who have uh, also developed way to collect, uh, but it's a lesser part of it. And this is why we are becoming operational, because unless we are organizing this collection, because the big issue is not to collect. 
uh, the, and also on not to sell the cream of the collection, because this has a great value. The big issue is what you are doing of the rest. And for the time being, the, the sorting volume does not expand. And so we need to expand this sorting volume globally in France and in Europe. And this is why we are going to become operational, because there, there is uh, an effort is needed uh, in order to collect more and to sort more with new rules. But we will keep also the historical uh, <laughs> voilà. network. Uh, the other question was? Was, was about the sort uh, how we did it. So, oh. No, sorting standards for oh, sorting use standards. Overseas. And so, as we are not actors for the time being, we, didn't, no, we don't have sorting standards, but they have sorting standards. In fact, they have a, a, the, uh, the contract we are signing with them is super precise about how well, the different categories they have to manage, the volume they have to manage, there is a minimum volume in order to be supported by a refashion, and the categories they have to do, and the, the ratio of the category. For example, they, have, they need to be, um, there is a minimum uh, objective of landfill, or, um, uh, which landfill doesn't exist anymore in France, but uh, uh, suppression. And uh, then the... Um, uh, elimination without energy. Um, but then, um, in terms of sorting standard, it depends on their consumer. They have clients. Every sorting facility has different consumers, different clients, and they have specification depending on their clients. For example, a sorting facility who will be working for Eastern countries will be sorting mostly uh, uh, warm clothes. When another one working for, uh, uh, for example, the Madagascar island, or IET will be sorting uh, what what is called uh, uh, um, tropical tropical clothes. Yeah. So it's, it depends on the consumer. Thank you. Is it my turn? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, my name is Anne Ludvigson. I'm from Sweden, and I represent the Swedish Textile Federation. And uh, of course, we are looking at we have initiatives to an EPR system in Sweden. Um, one obvious question, just listening here, is how do we define textiles? Uh, and how have you done that in France? And uh, I think the potential here is for a huge problem, because we're all exporting, sending things around the EU, and potentially we'll, we'll have because my understanding is that there is no definition of textiles today. And the potential is that we're going to have 27 different definitions. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm, in fact, it's, the definition is quite precise in France because we are, the EPR scheme is only about post-consumer clothes, home linen and footwear. This is uh, to say technical textile are not concerned. Um, uh, furniture textile are not concerned, professional textile, but this has been evaluated and it's less than 10%. The rest of textile in France is less than 10% and they've been organizing the, themselves in order to man manage their waste. And we are also collaborating, for example, concerning the furniture textile, we are collaborating with the furniture EPR scheme, which is managing their te textile. So we are collaborating with them in order to share, uh, for example, next year we, we should be able to share uh, more initiative with our new uh, uh, agreement, uh, which wasn't possible yet. But uh, the idea is, of course, to, um, uh, to share the best practice, because we're talking about, uh, even if there are more chemical product in the furniture textile or in the technical textile, then it's textile. So I think it's a, a very important question for like an organization like Eurotex to drive to the EU that let's start with a basic definition and then we mm -hmm. can always expand. Yes. Be because uh, like shoes and textiles is very different. Yes. Uh, it has been done only because the producer, retailer, distributor were managing both textile and shoes. And so, voila. <laughs> but uh, I think the scope can be different in the different countries. The French scope is this one, mm -hmm. but the scope can be different. The thing is that we need to work together anyway. 
the thing, this is major. Because, for example, we also have a sports, sporting good rep in France. Sporting good for Decathlon, for example. Where does it start? Where does it end? Okay, we've been defining. Okay, you take care of this, we take care of this, but we work together. Yes, there's a question here. Yeah. Thank you. Paolo Zegna from the textile and clothing industry in Italy. Uh, it may be a silly question, but while after your explanation it's very clear the importance of recycling, how, how re restructuring the whole thing to, to look and uh, create products, it's not very clear the concept of the extended producer responsibility. To what extension the responsibility go on the producer? So is it only, I mean, in France, you have a group of people that put themselves together, that finance yeah. the, the project. Is that the end of the responsibility? Or no. it goes well beyond every no, it single goes producer? Well beyond. I'm, okay, can I'm you going to that? give you an example. Eco-conception, we are not funding eco-conception. We are just uh, bringing together the different stakeholders, saying, okay, how do we uh, improve eco-conception, eco-design. How do we do that together? And they said, okay, we need to have a, a training webinar, we need to share the best practice together with the, the big players, we need to work with the big players who are far in advance. Again, Decathlon, Gatlon is one of the leading company for textile in France, so this is why I'm, naming, I'm quoting them. But you could say Groupe Ram, which is also part of our, uh, of our, of our board. Um, and so uh, the, the leading people who've been working on this eco-design for years, because this is not something new. 20 years ago, I was in the industry, we were already talking about that. We have to bear that in mind. So some stopped it, some continued it, and so, but we have to share the best practice. And we are here as a facilitator. And they are investing when they are doing eco-design. Eco-design is not cheap when you're starting. It costs a lot. And this is why you have to start small, and then you build up. But it goes along with raising the awareness of the consumer so that they will buy your product. So this is why all stakeholders have to work together. So in, in our example, so you have this uh, obligation, the, the extended uh, producer responsibility, uh, the collection is there, but the, the authorities fix targets. Uh, that, uh, what, what is the, the target of uh, reuse? Uh, what is the target of uh, recycled material? And uh, it normally increases. And if you do not get the target, then you can get uh, a fine. Uh, so we say you are not doing your job and eventually we lose our license as, as, as an association mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, taking care of this EPR. And also there is a, a part of our uh, funding that we have that is uh, we need to do it for research. So, uh, mm -hmm. It's an obligation to do research in eco-design. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, a part of your uh, money, uh, for each mattress you, you sell, part of this money is going to research because uh, mm -hmm. in next uh, generation products must be uh, completely recyclable uh, or usable recyclable of course in the past it was not possible but uh, this, the, it is a, a game between the, the, the manufacturers the retailers and also the authorities eh? And I want to mention I should have mentioned them mentioned it before but this is part of the whole scheme um, um, the REHUBS initiative, you, you heard about the REHUB initiative with Euratex, are really going also this way. It's a way to involve all the different stakeholders, the producers, the brands, the retailers, so that they work together and they invest together mm -hmm. towards this transformation. Mm -hmm. And then for sure, this is also uh, their own investment. We are not part of it. This is not the eco-contribution. But wh what makes it possible, this is also the way, okay, we need to do something. We need to move. We need a transition. And we are in, in it now. Yeah, but no doubt about that. Yeah. But then you said in two years and three months, we are going to be responsible. Well, so no, this is a learning curve. Yes, to, of course. To get into yes. that. But, but at the end of it, we have will to be accelerate. the responsibility for the producers? I agree. I agree. But the, the, um, the responsibility in the EPR is, uh, is limited. When I say it's limited, because most of it is done in each company. But, but I agree, it's a learning process. Uh, the preparations, uh, I told you, in Belgium for that specific project, five years of preparation, intense 
cooperation between all stakeholders and, and the authorities, because the authorities, they, they push. Uh, and, and we try to say, okay, it's realistic or not. So it's a learning process, still, still. Uh, Yes, good afternoon. My, my name is uh, Andrea Falchini. I am from Prato, from mm -hmm. a research center in Prato. And the question is, uh, okay, it's very clear that uh, EPR refers to post-consumer textiles, but um, pre-consumer waste is about 10 to 15 percent in weight mm -hmm. textile production. production. Mm -hmm. So the question is how to manage it. It, it is not so simple to sort for example uh, uh, pre-consumer waste have you done some experience on yes that? alors sorry to say that but it's much easier to sort pre uh, pre-consumer waste than post-consumer why depends, I'm just, depends no it depends why because of the homogeneity so huge difficulty for post-consumer this is the mix you have you have small pieces completely mixed with those 500 different material and it's not even half of the product on the retail. Yes, but it's much easier. So once you're doing the most difficult one, this is to say the sorting facility we are working on today, if they can sort post-consumer, for sure they will be sorting easily pre-consumer. And honestly, pre-consumer, we have uh, uh, all the existing recyclers in, uh, in France, they are dealing mostly with pre-consumer. and. Um, they don't have difficulties with it, uh, really, uh, already today. And they are looking for, <laughs> they are looking for resources because in France we, we don't have so many. But uh, and supply. <laughs> if we can do, yes, <laughs> great. Mm. If we can do post-consumer, for sure, pre-consumer is, uh, uh, is easier. But one thing we have to bear in mind is whenever we are doing a recycled product, we are, it's always a mix between post-consumer and pre-consumer. Uh, we need also all those, uh, and also we have a mix with professional or with uh, technical textiles because there are some uh, characteristic, some uh, chemical characteristic in the, in the other type of textile which are necessary to make the recipes. And so this is why we really have to work together. Yes? One, one more question. Last. This is the last question. Yes. Uh, one for you, Veronique. You know, a lot of talk about working together, but I noticed on the slide um, of members of the organization, there were a lot of very big names in French fashion that were not listed. Yeah. Was that just a function of the slide, or is that an ongoing challenge to get more brands involved in working together? No, no, no. In fact, those are the people who are owning the company. Those are the um, uh, shareholders of the company. So in terms of actual members who are participating? In terms of members, we have 10,000 members. So I can't make a list. <laughs> Got it. But uh, 10,000, I think we are at our maximum. And in fact, we had a trick this year to do that. I will explain, uh, uh, <laughs> I will explain it to you later. <laughs> OK, I think that we can. Uh, oh, well, you, you have the last word. Yes, 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 OK. The, the micro is good. OK. I had a similar question in mind. What about the non-members, the others? How do they fulfill their EPR uh, responsibilities? Oh, the non-member, the non-member. In, fa in fact, they are chased. <laughs> mm. When I say they are chased, when we started, and I think we will have this discussion with the people who want to launch EPR, mm. the start was difficult because uh, the state, the public authorities didn't help us. We had to chase them by all means, Fine, with all means. This is to say, just send an, a letter, call them, uh, you have to pay, and they were saying, okay, we will see. And, uh, and so it's been, the learning curve has been uh, very long, very long. But yeah. it needs to be compulsory, otherwise you have the free riders, and yes. the, the system will collapse in the end. So but everybody is participating yeah. or yeah. the system will not work. So that's uh, the EPR. And voila. But it, it takes time, yeah. Uh, you don't believe how creative some free raters are. Uh, <laughs> uh, the excuses are uh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you and uh, see you. <laughs>
Thank you.